that. Perfect. I gotta get better mic clips. A little busted out. Yeah. These are yeah, no, like, they're, they're like the soft silicone mm-hmm. kind of ones. So yeah. they're just half the time. I ha- when I set them up, I have to bend them back into so they're straight with the mic stand. Sure. Sure. All right. Get comfy. Are you using headphones or no? Um, sometimes I do for monitoring purposes, but okay. um, sometimes, uh, like my head starts real sweaty. I'm like, okay. that's not going to help if I put these on. Okay, <laughs> you know. All right, but you can use them if you want. They're there. Um, I mean, technically speaking, I don't need them. I don't need sure. to bring them. But you know, if you it feels like a real, a real sure. operation if I bring headphones. I'll listen you know? for a second. <laughs> as I, as I see what we got. Check. Hey, sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, beans on the counter. He'll be up there all the time. <laughs> unfortunately, he's untrainable. <laughs> beans. Yeah, that's, he's just. <laughs> and he'll be right back up. I hope he time. doesn't uh, touch the recorder. <laughs> just, it just be, stopped or yeah, something. No, we'll be all right. Does he know how to work? If, yeah, uh, he's, equipment. He tries to. <laughs> he's a curious cat for yeah. sure. So uh, how you been? What have you been doing? Um, so we're rolling here. What? Yeah. Are we rolling? No. Have we been rolling? Um, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Um, yeah, things are good. Things are busy. Um, yeah, still uh, playing a bunch of music and recording a bunch of music. So Engineering, producing. Yeah, engineering. Um, I'm here at On Deck Sound Studio. Um, I, um, yeah, I'm producing... Oof, God, there's a lot of albums coming out yeah. of here right now. So um, we just finished up. The main project that I do is Bell of the Fall. That album we just finished, we're mixing. Mm. Um, we got a single coming out from Jeff Presh. There's a single coming out from Cosmos Sunshine. Nathaniel Hintz just finished an album. Uh, Mark Marchetti just finished an album. Bob Tweedy, we're in the middle of that. We're Any relation the- to Jeff Tweedy? No, it's not. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, that'd be nice if it was, but um, <laughs> no. You have an in with Jeff. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and, and there's a you know there's a list of others. John Carl Gordon has a single coming out. Um, I mentioned Alex Forrest is doing um, an album. Eric Jacklin will be here at noon today, so he starts his album today. Cool. Uh, yeah. So there's a bunch of stuff that I'm you keeping know, busy. Yeah, no, it's great. It's been really good. We met uh, when we were part of a thing called Music in Common. Some this um like high school arts enrichment thing. Yes, specifically for music. That is, I think it's based in Massachusetts, like Sheffield or something. They're out there somewhere. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure where. I, I facilitated a couple programs yeah. for them, and um, I remember I remember um, me and all the kids involved. Came here to your studio. Yes. To uh, uh to to record a, a track. Do you remember how you got involved in with music in common for that? Was it, I, I can't remember. Was that your first time? Your first year doing it? <clears throat> um, it may have been. I think it was. It was I know in, I did a couple for them. It was um, what was it? Twenty fourteen. Uh, yeah, that you'd be, I think you'd be no you'd know better than <laughs> me on that. Um, <laughs> or yeah, I, it sounds about right. I yeah. think you know. Um. You could tell me it was 2005, though. Then, I would say, oh, yeah, okay, that sounds right. Yeah, everything uh, runs together. Yeah, <laughs> it really does at some point. Um, I, ooh, so yeah, so I used to teach at a place called the National Guitar Workshop. Okay, where's that? Which was all over the country. It oh. was actually, the, the home base was actually Litchfield, Connecticut, but really? they were a company that was, um, you know, we had campuses. There was one in Connecticut, but there was a campus in LA. There was a campus in, uh, Nashville, Seattle, Canada, all over the place. Cool. Um, you know, everyone from Steve Vai to Pat Matheny, um, taught there. It was a big summer program. Nice. That turned into, I started writing for Alfred books, oh, started writing yeah. bass books for them. I remember when I first came here, I saw, a, gu- a book of bass guitar chords that had your name on it. There was an ens- I wrote an encyclopedia for them. It was they called it a bass yeah. chord encyclopedia. I wrote a theory book for them and a musicianship book for them. That turned into 
um, workshop live, which was um, basically they they were it was a really good idea, and it was kind of a little bit. I'm not even sure the year, but it was before kind of YouTube really took off and 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 had every content imaginable on mm-hmm. it. Yeah, it was the the idea was there'd be a bunch of lessons online it'd be a subscription based mm-hmm. and it's kind of taken off where true fire has kind of done that at least for what i know is kind of perfected that now right. um this were no one had really done it yet where it was going to be a subscription based a five year kind of program and i wrote the actual base curriculum for it um that you'd come on and you'd be able to start from absolute beginner and go up to super advanced and mm-hmm. it'd be videos that we shot up in Pittsfield Mass and it was a really good idea that just you know it kind of got it took a hit from YouTube coming in and all of a sudden on YouTube you can find anything you want yeah. there's a, there's always someone on there saying oh here's how you do this here's how you do that yeah it also took a little bit of a hit in that we kind of geared it towards um the 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 main the main base of the Nash guitar workshop the main clientele was teenagers mm-hmm. for this summer workshop we kind of thought or they kind of thought that that would be their market so we geared the lessons towards that it mm-hmm. turned out that most of the people doing this stuff are the 40 to 60 year old guys who kind of now have money and still want to play a little bit of guitar. They don't really want to go to a music store for lessons. Mm. They like the convenience of their house, but we could gear the lessons as if like I pictured the lessons as if we were talking to teenagers. Well, Mm -hmm. that's a different audience than a 50 year old guy. You talk to them different. So anyways, that kind of, you know, um, a lot of work went into it and it didn't really pan out for them. Um, but back to music in common, this was a long way to get there, I guess. Um, why did I just, it's completely space on her name. Um, what was, wow. what was um, her name? Lynn or something? Or, wow. I just totally drew a blank on her name. Uh, <laughs> Lynette. 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 Yeah. Right. Lynette. Sorry. Sorry, Lynette. If you're listening <laughs> to this, um, yeah, she's still on my Facebook and we're friends and all that. And well, I just totally drew a blank. But anyways, uh, Lynette worked for Workshop Live. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I met her there. She now worked for, as you know, she was a videographer for Music in Common. When they were looking for a facilitator, Lynette recommended me. Oh, so okay. that's how I came to Music in Common was through her. They were looking for people to facilitate. They had a Torrington High, which I went to Torrington High. Oh. Um, and, um, were you, they, uh, born and raised a whole deal in Torrington? I was, I was born in Torrington, actually grew up in Harwinton. Oh, okay. But then, uh, my junior, senior year, I came back to Torrington High. So, mm. but the, so they knew there was a tie. So that, so that was it. So I kind of came into that. And, and, um, yeah, I only did a couple for them. Um, right. and, uh, yeah, it was, it was fun and, and cool. And, um. Yeah, and, and you you never had done a thing where you work with youngish children to to make a record. I had already been doing a program that I call, and I still do a program called the Art of Song. Okay, and that was part of the tie in too that they knew I was doing stuff like that. So right. I I go into schools and do songwriting workshops. Oh, okay. I, it's a little bit different than their format. Right, you know, right. Their kind of format is like we're going to do one song, we're going to write it in a day, and and right. you know, and do a video and 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 whatever. Um, you know, I kind of go into places, and it depends. Some are some are longer, but some are just you know a one day thing where we go in and just talk about songwriting and the creative process and and write a couple songs and and um, and do that. So I'm still doing that at, at times. So yeah, I did. I did a little bit before. Right. Okay. You know. I didn't. That's cool. I didn't yeah. realize that you were doing that before. Um, yeah. Before you came into Music in Common, and um, how well do you remember what hap- what happened with us and what we the song we the the track we did? Uh, pretty well, I think. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. I. I, I uh, yeah, I remember the group. I. <laughs> I um, I would have a hard time remembering names, but I, but I, you know, I remember like when you contacted me, I was like, oh, I remember that kid. Yeah. And, and, uh, 
And I remember the group. If you told me the hook, I'd remember it in a second. <laughs> I don't remember. I can't, you know, <clears throat> even here, like right now, I probably have 10 albums going. Right. Um, of which there's, you know, a hundred songs and, you know, there's times even here where I'm like, man, what is that song we're talking about? Like I just, <laughs> right. you know, I'm working on so much stuff. So to go back since 2014, I've probably produced, you know, whatever, you know, 1500 songs or something. Right, <laughs> so, right, right. um, to recall them immediately, I'm like, man, I couldn't hear that. I have no <laughs> idea what that is. But then the second I hear it, I'm like, oh, that song. Yeah. Okay. I mean, um, do you remember the, the I'll, chorus? I'll be the first to tell you that I, I'd rather not remember that song. But. <laughs> yeah, and that's it's 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 exactly the kind of thing you would think a bunch of kids would write, right? Or yeah. Especially because um, the way they the trajectory of the program is, they were very much like, oh, let's write the next Imagine or something like sure. that. Sure, sure, yes. But and then it, it, when I, while I was there, in my mind, I was like, can we just do a track? Does yeah. it have to be this? <laughs> sure, sure. And I think that's, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it, it, it's a, it's, it's an interesting program in that way. And that, um, you know, and again, I was just there as a facilitator right. at that point. Um, it's not, it wasn't my program, yeah, right. um, and, and whatever. And, and I was like, okay, just roll with it and, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and do that thing. I think, um, it's, it, it, songwriting is hard enough as it is. Yeah. Now you're asking a bunch of kids to really write to a specific thing. Yeah. So now you've made it even harder. Yeah. Like if you come to me and say, write me a song. It's okay, cool. I'll have you on tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Now if you say, write me a song that's about a girl, it just became a little bit harder. You've been more specific. Now, yeah. I've, now I have to write about a girl. Mm -hmm. Now if you say, write me a song about a girl named whatever um cindy okay now it became even harder because yeah. now i have to have cindy in the song right so they came in and said okay we're gonna write a song it's gonna be about a you know a, a topical thing yeah it's gonna be about changing the world we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna figure out how to change the world in a song <laughs> to which i was like wow that's that's that'd be tough for me like yeah. if you told me that we have and we have we already have we are the world uh. <laughs> yeah and 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 but now and we have um three hours to do this because in, <laughs> after, th after three hours, we need to move on and start working on a full blown video. We're going to shoot. Was it really just three hours? We were allowed to write a song. Probably. <laughs> do you know what I mean? In, in the grand scheme. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to think how that program worked, but I think I was just there for after school. Right. Yeah. For maybe a week we did. Uh, maybe, yeah. Okay. So it was probably, I think we did an hour and a half session, five days. So we had, what does that come out to? 7.5 hours. Right. And in the 7.5 hours, we had to, you know, we had to talk at times and talk right. about like what songs are and get there yeah. and like. And then like write it. And then a lot of time went to recording and then. Yeah. And then a lot of that time went to, um, the video. Yeah. You know, yeah. we split up into teams of like, okay, then now you're going to go work on the video. And right. like, so, so anyways, yeah, it was, it was a monumental task. And, you know, I, I tell people here in the studio, like, listen, if we can, you know, the, the, the simpler you keep things, the better it's going to sound with your budget. If you have unlimited time and unlimited budget, your art becomes what it is. You can yeah. do whatever you want. If you give me five hours, I'll have people that come here and say, okay, well, what's the budget? What are we working with? Okay, we have $1,000. Okay, so you have $1,000 and you want to make a 12-song album. Not, you know, even at, God, if you're at, you know, let's put a put a number of, you know, $50 an hour. We have 20 hours to make this record. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you want it to sound, you want it to be your Sergeant Pepper, which took <laughs> them six or seven months to make. Right. You know, it's, 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 it, it becomes, it's a tough task. Yeah. So in seven and a half hours, we were supposed to write, we are the world sh and, 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 sh and shoot a video for yeah. real. And well, I guess we, we did come here for some of that, Yeah. you know, but we were supposed to conceptualize, write, we are the world and shoot a video and, and, and conceptualize a video for we are the right, world right. and, and, and actually shoot a lot of the footage that day. Yeah. The, the footage was shot a lot of it at, at the school. So, yeah. 
So, I, yeah, and I don't blame you. I guess I, if, <laughs> if that were me, I would be like, I don't want to see that. You know, like, as, as, you know, like. Well, that's especially because, um, so I played guitar on sure. the track. And first of all, I would like to say sorry. I would tell you sorry because I remember I had only been playing guitar for three months at that <laughs> sure, point. Right. Sure. And we were trying to track the guitar part. Sure. And then like I couldn't keep in time. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, let's we'll start, you know, a quarter notes or something. <laughs> and then eventually we went to whole notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember that. <laughs> That's one thing I do remember. <laughs> that this, this kid who's playing, who's just picked up guitar cannot play. And that's it. And it's like, it's just, it, it's, it's this unrealistic situation of like, everyone needs to participate. Right. But also, like, if we were actually making a record, you wouldn't, I mean, like, the, the Beach Boys weren't allowed to participate on their records. And they were pretty good players at yeah. that point. Do you know what I mean? So, like, they would come in and they'd be like, no, you're not, you're not playing on this. Like, and they'd be like, Wait a minute! I'm like the guitar player. They're like, no, there's. Maybe see, Brian got this idea. We're just going to do a whole orchestral thing, you know, it's, it's, or something. Yeah, but even even so, I mean, uh, Hal Blaine played drums on on most of their stuff, yeah. and and Dennis was a good drummer. You mm-hmm. know, he just wasn't Hal Blaine, and it was like, okay, sorry, yeah. dude. Like Hal Blaine's playing on this. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah. You know, like <laughs> so. Um, yeah, it's it was it's an interesting concept. Well, when did you start playing music? Um, I was, so I was 10 years old when, when I, you know, begged for a guitar and, and got an acoustic guitar. Mm -hmm. I wanted an electric guitar and my parents didn't really, you know, get it. You know, back then it wasn't, I don't think people were as, um, you know, not as many people played. There wasn't the, the kind of, um, understanding of, of, you know, um, pop music and rock right. music as okay. a thing. And everyone kind of thought like that's, you just start on acoustic guitar. That's the way it is, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. And you learn to read music out of Mel Bay's primer one and right. you learn to play, you know, Oh, and the saints and, you know, you read right. notes and mm-hmm. everything else. And for me, I wasn't that excited about that. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I want an electric guitar. I right. wanted to play like ACDC and black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and like, Right. The stuff I was excited about. My brother and sister are both older. Right. So I was listening to their records right. and like this. Having is, older siblings is like the uh that gateway into like, oh, they have the cool records. Yeah, oh absolutely. Yeah. So that was like um you know, my brother had a big, you know, Kenwood stereo system with big speakers right. and you know, and um so yeah, so I wanted to do that and like, you know, you can't play Black Sabbath on an acoustic guitar. So <laughs> I mean, you can try. <laughs> you can try, but it just doesn't work, you know. Right. So and and I and I'll tell people that, you know, today it's mm-hmm. like you're setting that kid up to not really be satisfied with what's happening because right. you can't play it, you know. I, I, I'd rather see, and not to their fault. I mean, they didn't, you know. They were like, it was great. They bought me a guitar. That's amazing. Right. Um, and they and they drove me to lessons and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but for me, it just didn't like translate so this isn't what that's about right. um but i kept kind of you know kept at it i finally bought um i just saw a buddy of mine that i bought his flying v um in to do seventh grade um and just started to try to figure it out you know and right. and, and and um between between us between everyone just listening to records and right. just figuring stuff out you figured enough out to to start to play and and eventually I I switched to bass, mm-hmm. um, and that kind of became my main instrument and still is my main instrument, um, and that switched eventually to upright bass and right. I studied at the Hartford Conservatory, um, as a jazz performance major and um, yeah, a lot of stops in between and but that's kind of the right. qu- the quick tour of how I got into it at least. Right. Now, if you, if you started playing at 10, do you remember the time perhaps maybe a few years before then where like you just, you heard music and you were like, man, it, you were, you were transfixed. Was there like a particular record that like blew your mind and made you think, man, music is cool. I want to play music. Yeah. I think, um, 
I'm trying to think if I can pinpoint an exact record, but I guess it was just all those bands. Like I heard like, you know, ACDC, I heard Zeppelin, right? you know, Zeppelin four was one for me that mm-hmm. like, yeah. um, you know, it's, it still sounds, it's, it's even as a recording engineer, I hear that record and it doesn't sound like they made it on this planet almost, right. you know, it just yeah. sounds like a different thing. You don't, you don't hear that and picture guys, at least I don't like in a studio making a record. That's because they were at Headley Grange. Yeah, but you don't hear them. I guess you don't hear them anywhere. Do you know right. what I mean? It just it almost, just it sounded otherworldly. Yeah, the it sound just sounds it. like wow. This is like there's some magic in here of like yeah, you know, even going to California, which is you know, um, it's like a folk song. Yeah, but there's a vibe to it that's just like wow. It just sounded to me yeah different. Um, yeah, and then probably honestly for me it was probably ACDC. Like I was a huge. I mean, you, you Angus remember was like which was record? It. Was it like back in black or before then? Um, it was, it was probably the the combination of those. It was back in black along with for those about to rock along with uh, probably for me back then it was you know Dirty Deeds Highway to Hell yeah. back in black uh, for those about to rock right. those four were the big ones okay. for me. Where now I gravitate probably more to like Powerage and and, right, and right. Um, some of the more raw first Bon Scott records. Right. Um, but yeah, as a kid, it was those kind of four records. And yeah, I mean, I still I have a, I have the same basic SG that you know he plays, and still probably my favorite guitar. Right. And 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 I never honestly the funny part is I never really became an electric guitar player. Right. right. In the end, I still don't consider myself an electric guitar player. Right. But that's definitely the 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 route I was. Yeah. I wanted to do. Right. Um, I just gravitated towards bass and and just r- rolled with it. Right. Uh, for me, I I specifically remember the moment where okay. music changed my life. I like it. Uh, I think I was 15. First, some background. I I, I didn't grow up playing music or anything like that. Okay. Uh, my music. My family is not musical. Okay. No one. No one really cared for music. I don't think. It, I even heard like actual music until I got an iPod when I was like 12. Wow. <clears throat> and I, I was listening to like bad pop punk or whatever, uh, like Blink-182 or that kind of stuff. It wasn't until I was 15 when I had procured a copy of a U2 compilation okay. called U2 18 Singles. Okay. I listened to the first few tracks and I was like, man, these are great. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the, these, these are good tracks. And then the song... I came across the song Where the Streets Have No Name. Yeah. Which is the first track off the Joshua Tree. Yeah. And like it blew my mind wide open. Sure. Just the um I couldn't believe the production. It was like this ethereal synth uh shimmering guitar edges shimmering guitar with these echo and delay effects and the this wall of sound they could build with just what was essentially vocals, guitar, bass, drums and synth. Sure. And the amount of space I could perceive between the instruments within the mix, it just threw me for a loop. And yeah. I thought, man, this is music. From then on, I was like, man, like I'm a music nerd now. I'm going to, I'm going to research records. I'm going to get a bunch of records and listen to them and like figure out who, who, who influenced you to, who influenced the guys who influenced you to who, um, who do they listen to? Who were they playing with at the same time? Who did, or what other bands look up to them and stuff sure. like that. I, I listened to, to like all of it. I went through like fifties rock and roll to, uh, you know, the British invasion and psychedelic rock and seventies hard rock with like Zeppelin. And like, um, I think my favorite kind of hard rock album is who's next by the who from 71. Yeah. yeah. And, not only that, but I discovered stuff like jazz, jazz music, classical music, um, bluegrass, all that kind of stuff. And it, cause I felt like if I love music this much, I'm going to, I have to consume all of it. Yeah. You yeah. went deep. I like it. That's good. Yeah. And, um, oh, but then I didn't start playing until three months before I met you. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I, um, well, I guess the first thing I ever touched, that was not like an elementary school recorder was piano keyboard when I was about 16. Cause I, okay. I took, um, 
an introduction to piano course at the high school. Um, although I wouldn't say it taught me anything, but it did give me the impetus to like buy my own keyboard and start studying, quote unquote, studying piano on that. Sure. Um, but I don't think it really got serious until I did pick up guitar three months before I met you. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. All right. And are you playing now? Or are you, yeah, did you, totally. Did you, okay, good. Totally. Good. Um, nice. Trying to like get as many instruments as I can, trying to find weird instruments and sure. stuff. Sure. Um, I think currently I have a bunch of guitars, um, uh, one of each. One, and I have an acoustic, which is an Epiphone Hummingbird Pro. Okay. Um, an electric, which is a Mexican Telecaster. All right. Uh, and a classical guitar, which is a Cordoba C5 CE. Nice. All and right. um, what else? I have, you know, tambourine egg shakers uh, sure. uh some mongos uh a glockenspiel yeah uh a tenor ukulele okay and a melodica that's what i have so far yeah nice i have all those <laughs> it's fun toys yeah yeah they are it's good they're like they're all just kind of colors that you get to work with and the more colors you have the, the cooler stuff you can do you right. know or or the yeah, the, it just it gives you different options, and and for me as a producer, I find anytime I get something, it just ends up. I don't need it, but the second I get it, I'm like, oh, cool, that's going to be on records, you know. <laughs> and I'm usually playing it, right? You know, like I bought that cello six months ago; it's, it's already on <laughs> on records, you know. And a friend of mine dropped off a really nice lap steel, a 1940s uh, Rickenbacker lap steel, All right? And I played it on a record the next day, you know. It wasn't like I needed a lap steel on that record, but all of a sudden it's here. So you know, I have a harmonium. Um, oh, cool. Which, um, you know, now they have it, it makes it on a bunch of records. Right. You know, um, they're all just different flavors that add interesting stuff. And, you know, and even combine, I mean, I have a, you know, uh, I just, I, I just, the new record we just finished. I gave it to a buddy of mine as a preview and, and who's, you know, got a good ear and, and listens to the stuff. And it's interesting to hear his interpretation of a lot of the stuff that's, um, the odd stuff that you can kind of just make up where, right. you know, um, combining guitars that makes it sound like a harpsichord, you know, if you're playing in different octaves and, right. and whatnot. And, um, you know, I have a kid's, a child's piano in there that's on the record that sounds, amazing you know like a like a boy piano yeah it's like a little the, just a little pink toy piano that oh, okay um, kind of like um mark mother's ball from devo yeah he composed the uh theme to rugrats on a just a toy piano yeah no they're great i mean it's it's it's, it's in tune it sounds just got a cool little sound and um yeah it's just a little pink you know piano mm -hmm. and, and it has yeah. all the notes on it it tells you where to play and stuff <laughs> and, and, um <laughs> But yeah, it's it's uh it's fun stuff, you know. Did you ever have any formal study in music? Yeah, I went to I I studied at the Hartford Conservatory. Did you ever like take lessons as a kid or? Well, so I took I took lessons at in, in I, I'm from Torrington, Connecticut, and there was a place called Leo's Music. Mm -hmm. I took lessons there for a little bit. Um, but it was kind of one of those old school, like, you know, you smoked a cigar and in the back <laughs> and you're like, oh, this is kind of just weird as a 10 year old kid. It right. just was like, this kind of sucks, you know? So, <laughs> um, so that really didn't take. And then I ended up in, it wasn't till, uh, in my twenties that I switched to, and I, before that, even I had taught at, at, at a music store in, mm -hmm. in, you know, probably at 19, I got a job teaching, um, mm -hmm. and I had no idea what I was doing, but <laughs> I was in a popular band, you know, right. in, in town and people wanted to take lessons and I was like, oh, sure, whatever. So I taught there, but then I ended up studying with a guy, Dave Santoro. Oh, cool. Yeah. He's the, um, uh, he's a big, uh, uh jazz bassist who yes. uh, he teaches at Berkeley. Yes. So Dave at the time taught at the Hartford Conservatory. I had seen Dave play a show in Torrington. Um, a, a duo with um, uh, what was it? Uh, Kobus is the last name. I can't think of the guitar player's first name. Bob, maybe Bob Kobus. But they played a show, and the first it, it just turned out the first song they played was Equinox from from John Coltrane. Cool, which is nice. Like it's really straightforward. It's just a minor blues, and it mm -hmm. was like a 
perfect gateway into jazz. Right. I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, I can latch on to this. Um, because it's tough at first when you're listening to jazz and there's it all is, these changes it, it going by and you're like, I don't know, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. I had you the know? same I remember I when I first got into jazz, like I I heard like kind of blue. That was my first record by sure. Miles Davis. And I'm like, man, this is great. This is it's first of all, that record is really accessible. Yeah. But that's then, a good gateway. But then um you do have to have you you have to do some kind of homework before you start listening to jazz though, because people tend to not recognize the format where it's like um, you, you play through the tune yeah. and then people take turns soloing. Over the song still. Yeah. People don't understand so, that. So over the changes. Um, and then when they when everyone decides, oh, we're going to end the song, they play through the first bit again. Yeah, play and, through the melody. Yeah. So the but the thing yeah. is, when I, I remember specifically listening to a Brad Meldow record. Yep. And it's a live record. There's just once, like all the songs are like, 20 minutes long sure or the tracks really and i'm just like i don't think i got it because i'm just like when i was telling my friend it, go, it goes on and then my brain kind of checks out i'm like uh, but that's it but you're also you're jumping into a form a form that over time gradually expanded yeah so in the you know in the teens it was it wasn't coming from that we weren't taking all these big changes it was basically coming from a blues more of a that that um from that you know style right and it was much simpler and much easier to digest people weren't playing so outside the changes you listen to a louis armstrong record it is accessible his melodies are more accessible is but you jump right in on john coltrane or ornette coleman and you're yeah. like what is happening here yeah. like this i have no idea yeah if you if you want to go in a soft push into jazz would not be listening to Giant Steps. Yeah, not at all. And that's, you know, so that was, so, so to hear Dave, you know, um, who's a great player, I heard him playing Equinox, the first song. It was a duo with a guitar player, which mm -hmm. was more accessible for me, being that it was guitar. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was it. I went out. I mean, it was probably a week later. I bought an upright bass. I was like, <laughs> I got to play, I got to play this instrument. And, and, um, and I didn't know who he was and whatever, but a friend of mine was like, oh, yeah, he lives in Torrington. You know? So I was like, oh, I tracked him down, and I right. said, hey, I'd love to come take lessons. And he's like, yeah, come check it out. you know. And, right. and he tells the story that I showed up with the bass, and like I didn't have a case, and I was kind of <laughs> carrying it on my shoulder. I didn't know what to do with it. And he's like, oh, man, this is rough. <laughs> but then we really hit it off, and um, you know, he was great to me. I, 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 uh, I studied with him for – probably at least a year before I went to the conservatory. And then even at the conservatory, I was still, you know, going to his house and through, and I really, um, you know, I started at that point, I started, you know, painting his deck and <laughs> could to get lessons, you right. know, and um, I'd go and hang out and he'd make sandwiches and we'd play music. And, right. um, and he needed a bass player at the conservatory, at the Hartford Conservatory. He didn't have an upright bass player. And okay. being kind of a, you know, David is a jazz guy, you know, like he wants, he's from that bebop school. Right. And, and, and um, he's not a huge fan of electric bass and, and whatever. So <laughs> yeah. he needed an upright bass player. I was like, man, if you come, I'll, I'll get you scholarship and the whole thing. And I'm like, all right, great. So I, um, I went and, you know, and applied and, and he put his word on it and it was good. And they gave me a scholarship and everything else. And it's, you know, a month later, school's about to start. And he asked me to transcribe, um, I think it was a Paul Chambers solo or something. And I mm -hmm. came in with some kind of hieroglyphics written. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, what the heck is this? And I'm like, oh, that's how I write music out. <laughs> He's like, wait a minute, you don't read music? <laughs> you don't like, even have a clef here. <laughs> yeah, no, I was not. I didn't have anything. I didn't have I didn't have a staff paper. Yeah. I just I just had my own like thing I came up with. And uh, you know, he's like, Wow, we gotta get you to know how to read. Like, yeah, you're going in on a scholarship. You can't read music, you know. So I did a crash course in sight reading and uh but then so I went there for a couple of years and and uh and did that, and uh, yeah, that was kind of you know the formal training, and then now when we say Hartford Conservatory, is that the same thing as the Hart School? No, it's, it was a separate. Or, it was a okay. separate, just music conservatory. Okay, I, it's now uh, it's it's no longer in existence, but it was in, in existence for a long time, mm -hmm. 
And it was just a straight conservatory. And a cool. conservatory just means there's no academics. Yeah. It's 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 like um all day music. Yeah. You know, it's it's sixty credits of music, which um gets you, you know, nothing. <laughs> um, you know, it gets you to say, like, oh, I went to a conservatory. Yeah. <laughs> um it doesn't it's not a degree really, it's not anything. I, I ended up um taking that to uh, Northwestern Community College and getting a um, an associate's degree and then in, went in on what exactly? to get uh, general studies okay. for there. <laughs> right. Just it was kind of the easiest one to get the degree. Right. And then I went to uh, Charter Oak for my bachelor's, which they ended up. Um, Charter Oak was cool in that they let me, you can, you can, at that point, you know, I was a professional musician. Mm -hmm. So I went in and, and, and you could, um, apply for life credits to get your bachelor's degree. Right, okay. You could write papers and say, right. So like there was, you know, there's, and you could basically challenge any core, any accredited course in the country, uh, any accredited college course in the country towards your bachelor's degree. So you could go in and say, so, and there was classes, like there was, I forget what the class was, but um, there was a class that was actually using one of my books hmm. at Berkeley. Oh, okay. Um, I think it was Berkeley. Anyways, there was an accredited course. I'm trying to, uh, yeah, that was using that book that I wrote for Alfred mm -hmm. as part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So it was easy to say, like, hey, well, they're using the book that I wrote to teach this class. I'm fairly confident I could pass this class. All right. You know? Seeing as I wrote the book, they're using <laughs> to teach it. Uh, <laughs> so, c can you please give me those three credits? And, <laughs> yeah, and I got those three credits. Okay. You know, and so you got your bachelor's in what field? Um, in it's a liberal arts degree in um, music history and literature. Okay, it's a it's a double like yeah. It's mm, a, okay, I forget exactly what they termed it, but it's yeah, music history and and literature. So. Okay. Which was cool because like when I went there, I was like, yeah, I don't really feel like I've already studied at the conservatory. I've, I've, you know, committed my life to music mm -hmm. in the same way. I kind of, you know, which I respect your kind of thing of saying like, oh, okay, why don't I go back and check out all the stuff that came before? Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, you know, I felt like, yeah, I don't really, um, I don't think I'd be that enriched by, taking more music classes at this point. Right. So I ended up kind of taking more literature classes, which I thought was just cooler and, right. and, and whatever. So the end of the college career was, you know, focused on literature. Right. Um, when again, I was still, I was already working and I was teaching and I was writing music books and doing all that. So, right, okay. I'm currently, uh, enrolled at the university of Hartford and I'm minoring in music. Nice. And uh, I think, in my case, I'm more, I'm less about doing like history and literature. I'm really, I'm really a nerd for theory. Sure. Um, that was, I have this background of like in sciences and whatever. And I just really like looking at the nuts and bolts of how it works. Sure. And to the point where you know, I'd spent, since I started quote unquote studying piano, sure. that was my first step in studying theory. I never learned to, I didn't learn to read music, but I learned the hell out of how music works. Yeah. You know, I was studying intervals, scales, uh, weird, really out there stuff that like practically doesn't really make sense just because I was really fascinated by like octatonic scales and whatever, you know? Yeah. 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 For me, it's like I spent a bunch of years doing that stuff. Um, you know, the conservatory again, it's just, it's, it's full on, all music all day, you right. know? So there was, you know, I'd go from theory class to bass, you know, um, to a jazz ensemble, to a, you know, piano class, to a just on and on and on. So, and a lot of that was heavy into, um, you know, those sides of it. So would, yeah. would you say like you're competent in reading and like the theory bits? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can I can read music, and I you know I've written a theory book, so I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 I'm fairly <laughs> yeah. versed in it. Um, 
Yeah. Because so. for me, I didn't, so I didn't really learn to read music until I took my first theory course last year. Cause I had to take this placement exam to make sure like that I wanted this particular class that has a fundamentals prereq. Sure. And I thought, yeah, but I do know theory. So I could, I bet I don't want to spend the semester being bored and not learning much of any quote unquote anything. Sure. So like, so I did take that placement exam and I knew where the notes were on his staff, but it does, it does take me a while to like parse it out. Uh, and then when I actually get, got into that theory class, um, we did, of course, we did spend a lot of time reading and it, it was a struggle for me, especially because I, I still can't read really even after two th- rather intensive theory courses where you, you read a lot. Sure. I find myself not, it's not exactly a skill for me. I wouldn't say reading music is a skill. I'm not good enough for it to be, to become a skill yet. Okay. But I see it as a tool because sure. like if I'm trying to figure this thing out by ear, but it's like, I just cannot get it. Uh, okay. I, I know how to read music. I can look at the, the sure. sheet and then figure, figure it out. Also, since I'm so inept at reading, I can only really read like one, one line at a time. Sure. You know, just literally just one note at a time on, on one clef. On, on a single clef at a time. And so I found myself gravitating towards like jazz lead sheets where most of what I want to do is just learn songs. Sure. And, you know, standards and stuff. I try to, I think of myself as an aspir- aspiring jazz guitarist. And I figured, well, jazz sheets look like this. I can only really process one particular line at a time. And it's just a melody. Plus the chord changes up, up top. Because I play guitar, that's how I process chord changes. So I figured, yeah, I'll just buy a bunch of real books so I can learn standards and stuff that way. And currently, that's the extent of my reading, processing lead sheets like that. Yeah, yeah. reading single lines. It's all just, you know, so it's like it's like anything. Um, you know, you can know how to do something, but then you just have to practice doing that thing to become proficient at it, to right. get good at it. So reading, it's like, you know, reading music, it's almost like when you were a kid, you just forget that when you started reading English or reading you yeah. know, language, um, you started going see, spot, run, and you yeah. kind of read a letter at a time. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what you do in music at first. You read a note at a time, and eventually you start reading phrases, and eventually you can look at lines of music and kind of process it as in the same way you process reading text. Mm-hmm. Um, but that just takes, it's just, you got to do it every day for, right. you know, I forget exactly what the time might be, but if you do it every day for a year, let's say you'll be like, oh, okay, I can read music. And yeah. then you kind of have that skill and, and you may not like even for me. I don't read music a lot. I don't have any reason to. Right. Um, Unless so, like you become a session musician or something. Well, even that. I don't. I don't. You know, it's very rare that I go to a session mm-hmm. and someone has a written piece of music for me. Right. You know, I I usually if I'm if I'm here, I play everything. You know, there's singer songwriters come and I play every instrument. If I'm going to a studio to play, generally I'm going as a bass player. If I'm going to another studio, right. and I've done session work in New York, I've done it all over. If um, generally as a bass player in that sense, they're just giving me a chord chart, you know, mm-hmm. and saying like, here's the changes, you know, here's make up a bass line for this. Mm-hmm. You know, we're playing a bluesy thing or we're playing whatever here's kind of the groove and i write a bass line on the spot or they give me um they might give me an idea for a written out bass line but it's just one idea for a groove Mm -hmm. and then i read that groove and i say okay cool but it's not like i'm so you know generally for like a bass player the reason i would get back my chops of reading is if i'm doing a musical Mm-hmm. Or I'm doing something where I have to read like all the time, where I'm reading a whole book of tunes. Right. And then it's like, you know, first day, I'm like, oof, I'm a little rusty here. I've got to like get my chops back of sight reading. And then three days in, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, cool. It all came back and I can read again because I spent that year or whatever it was reading every day. I committed right. to saying, okay, I need to be able to sight read. Um, but yeah, I, I Generally, if I'm if I need to read something, it's a couple measures hmm. of a groove, and I'm like, oh, okay, cool, I got it. I understand right. what you want me to play. Okay, 
it's not like I'm reading again. Like if I do um, Greece, mm-hmm. there's yeah. 20 songs, and there's a book that I have to play those actual bass lines. So, All right. When did you start engineering and producing? I bought my first set of ADATs um, in. Maybe 1992. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's kind of where it started, you know. And before that, I had a little Tascam. Uh, I forget what they were called. The cassette, mm-hmm. you know. It was, yeah. a, it was a little four-track machine. Um, but that I didn't. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I never made. I never <laughs> made anything right. of, of note. So the ADATs kind of. I bought it. I ended up buying a 24-channel board mm-hmm. and and a pair of ADATs, which I still own. Um, right. They were the first kind of. As, they were one of the first, at least. I mean, my history may not be perfect here, but they were one of the first kind of accessible things to buy and make records for a, a novice or right. someone starting out. Before you had to go buy a you know a reel to reel and 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 just things got real pricey real right. quick. Right. These were you know two thousand dollar units, and you were in the game. You know, you could mm. just start recording. Um, so that was it. I started recording my own stuff, some stuff for friends. Eventually, I jumped into Pro Tools, um, and it just kept progressing, kept progressing, and I built the studio here. I, I had, I started like many people in the basement, and then eventually was going to put a studio in Torrington. It never really fleshed out. Ended up building this wing off of the house that is the studio, you know, as a studio. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, over the years have collected a bunch of really obscene, uh, toys, <laughs> uh, in terms of microphones and preamps and different stuff. Mm-hmm. And early on it was, it was, I was lucky that early on I bought a Neumann U87 mm-hmm. was one of my first purchases. And immediately it was probably two years into recording. I bought a, a U87 and uh, so let's say 95 or something. And immediately I was like, oh, I get it. I understand why my records sound so crappy. You know? <laughs> and I understand why these other ones right. sound better. You know, immediately it was like, man, that just upped the level. I went from a, an, a, uh, an AKG, what was it, a C3000, which is, a you know, a $300 mic to a U87, which is – been on you know a million records it's a right. classic microphone from i think Neumann. it was um it was george martin's favorite microphone to use yeah it's a great i mean it's a great mic um you know and 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 so immediately i was like okay like stop buying junk <laughs> and and rather than buying a 500 hundred dollar preamp let's wait you know rather than buying three five hundred dollar ones let's wait and buy a three thousand dollar mic preamp mm-hmm. um until we have the money and I just kept piecing pieces right. to the collection that were really good and now we have a you know u forty seven from telefunken and you know neve prees and a neve board and uh you know the general like monitors and stuff that like you know I like to tell people here being um being a smaller studio, I don't have every flavor, but the main flavors I have are all found in any, you know, I have a U87 and a U47. They're the two most classic microphones of all time in my mind. Mm. They're on every record you've ever heard. They're it. They're kind of the the microphones. Mm-hmm. Do I need every other mic in the world, you know? And I still have a bunch of big collection for drums and I have, you know, other condensers and whatever. But, you know, in other words, I don't have 50 microphones like that, Mm. which you could go and obscenely pay those kind of prices in New York City. But you don't really need those kind of all that stuff. Um and again, with you know the the monitors were were monitoring off of are in any world class studio in the world. The preamps we're using are the same as mm. any world class studio in the world. Right. It's just I don't have seventy of them, which you could find in some studios where you walk mm. in, like wow, that's. But generally, my day is spent using one at a time. Right. You know, I mean, I, I after we track drums, 
I'm now recording or I'm using a pair, you know, and mm-hmm. I have most of the times in a studio, it's nice to have your pre's, your compressors have pairs of things. So now if I want to record a stereo signal of a guitar, I can have a pair of microphones on it that match into a pair of pre's that match into a compressor right. that match and have that sound. But so did you did you ever feel a a point where you thought you thought you knew what you were doing in terms of production because um I think I think one of the reasons I started doing this podcast here it was kind of subconsciously to give me that push to actually learn how to record and produce stuff audio sure and I started this about a month ago it took me that long up until about a couple of days ago to learn how the compressor works okay I'm glad you learned now <laughs> that we're doing this <laughs> yeah if um I don't know. It's been a long time now since I felt, but I still feel like I'm, I'm the, that's the cool part about anything that's worth doing. It's, there's always stuff to learn and grow and get better. And, and, um, yeah, I still feel like I'm pushing myself to make better records and I'm trying to make, I feel like the last, the, this latest bell of the fall record is the best record I've ever made, you know? Um, and I, and I feel like the stuff I'm producing for other people is the best stuff I've ever produced. So I still, I always feel like I'm, I'm trying to push it and keep getting better and keep, um, just getting more creative and more command over, uh, you know, what I'm doing. Would you say there was a point where you finally felt like I actually do know how to like use most of this stuff and know how to produce a record? Was there a point when you thought when that feeling came to you? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, hmm. I think you keep feeling that throughout your career. You know what I mean? I think you, you, you keep feeling like, yeah, I really got it now. And then five years later you feel like, yeah, I really got it now. (laughs) And you look back like, God, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so right now I feel like, yeah, I really got it now. (laughs) And maybe in five years I'll be like, God, what were you thinking? But I feel like I'm 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 to a point now where I put on records and and um and they compete. I think that's the deal. Like when you get to a point where you feel like, man, I'm putting that up against a Tom Petty record and mm. it sounds just as good. You know? <laughs> yeah. I think we're there, you know? All right. Um I'm I'm you know, and that's and I'm producing a record for a guy Mark Marchetti right now, who's you know, we're having this discussion. He's like, Yeah, well, you know, I put it in and like Still feel like you know that one Wallflowers record sounds better. So, okay, well, well, you've cherry picked like every record of the of of recorded the history of recorded music. Yeah. You cherry picked every record, and you found like three that you think sound better than yeah. the record. I think we're there, man. Like put the mixing, like just put it away, and we're there. It sounds amazing, you know. Yeah, so I think that's it. I feel like, you know, gear wise, I'm there. I have all the tools I need in that way. And I feel like I know how to use it all now in a way that I can make records that sound the way I want them to sound, right. which, is, which is cool. And, and again, yeah. history will tell. Maybe in five years, I'll be like, wow. I'm, but I still feel like, I guess there's not, now I'm getting to a point where I can look and say, like, oh, yeah, that Jeff Presh record we made, mm. uh, Jeff Presh and the outfit uh, we made. It's an amazing sounding record. Um, you know, there's a Krista Moon record. I'm just kind of winging it. That that was, you know, whatever, six years ago. I'm like, wow, that sounded amazing. And I could go back and just keep saying, like, yeah, that was, we had it. You know, 15 years ago, right. I don't, I kind of, there's not much I want to hear where I'm like, <laughs> man, I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but that's everyone, you know, you're in it. You try to just keep making better records, you know? Um, and not that it was all bad, but I hear it now and I'm like, ah, I wish I, you know, had a little better gear. I wish I, I knew what I was doing more, you know? Mm-hmm. One last thing I want to pick your brain about. Sure. Uh, is songwriting. So when I first started playing, I was really inspired by, you know, Bob Dylan and the Beatles. Okay. And the thing was. It's all you need. Stop the, there. The, you're the, done. the thing it. I want, you know, is like. I thought the thing I want to do is like write songs, yeah. like write songs as good as these. And it took six years for me to write my first song a month ago. Okay. It's not and bad. It's good. Pretty good. But the thing is, it 
it doesn't sound like a Bob Dylan song and it doesn't sound like a Beatles song because um, I tend to approach it very methodically, if you know what I mean. It sounds like a jazz standard. Okay. That's what it is. It's, you know, it's A-A-B-A, 32 bars, um, A-1, A-2, the bridge, then A again. And it just, you know, there's a swing to it and the lyrics are just kind of, they sound like Fly Me to the Moon or something. Sure. And, you know, it's, for some reason, that's how it came out. And it, I, I think it sounds okay. It's, it sounds like a standard. Yeah. But it sounds like you have that in your influence. I mean, certainly McCartney was a standards guy. You yeah. Know? Like he, was, he put out a record of standards in like 2012. Yeah. yeah. But even his stuff, you got to, I, I think people forget that. Like those guys grew up listening, hearing a lot of standards. Mm hmm. You know, they got into, you know, Skiffle and all the different stuff and got into Buddy Holly and and that. But And even they, but they were even the the song yesterday is structured like a standard. Yeah, oh absolutely. So so think about like so he was born in what, forty two, I think? Yeah, I think so. About, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in forty two, like we're we're still quick math 13 years away from rock and roll you know what yeah. i mean so it's not until he's 13 that like the birth of rock and roll happens right so as a 10 year old 11 year old 12 year old even up in two it's not like it's not like people think like oh rock happened and everything else like stopped or something right you know what i mean his mm -hmm. parents were still listening to to standards, you yeah. know? I mean, his mom died, but you know what I mean? Like, people were still listening to yeah. big band and swing and this stuff. So, yeah, and, so, yeah. you know, like a year before he joined the Quarrymen, it was 59. That was like one of the biggest years for jazz records. Yeah. So, those guys had all these influences. Um, and that's it. I think, you know, for songwriting, it's, it's everyone kind of takes all their collective stuff. And um, and puts it together, and and that's what makes stuff interesting, you know. Right. Um, you know, even even like for me right now, the the Bell of the Fall thing. There's two kind of songwriters, and and all the influences come from like such a wide range that it, it sounds you, you come up with something unique, which is always interesting to me. Right. And I'm not. I don't. I don't like it as much, and it it works, and and whatever. It it, it is. There's something to be said for both things, you know? Again, I'm talking ACDC, who's written the same song over and over again for, yeah. <laughs> for every album yeah. with, with the same chords and the same deal, and it's still amazing. Uh, you know, the Sex Pistols had a thing, and that's cool yeah. too, but it always interests me, the bands um, that take all these why, like Queen's a band. Like, they don't sound like anyone. They sound like Queen, hmm. um, you know? Um, the Who's a band. They sound like the Who. You know, the the great bands to me sound like there's no one else that sounds like them. Right. Talking Heads. Sound like Talking Heads. That's it. Yeah. So you take a bunch of that stuff and it, and it becomes becomes interesting. You know, for for in terms of where your songwriting goes. You know. Now, in terms of your songwriting, uh, of the records I've heard of yours, it's not. Of course, it's not really ACDC kind of records. But they're kind of like singer songwritery acoustic based kind of kind of sure records. yeah so some um depend have you now are you talking the bell of the fall records or my <clears throat> solo records or I'm, I've heard mostly your solo records okay. I think so those the ones with my name on them are definitely yeah they kind of went it was kind of a point where I was saying. Like I've always told people, if I sang like Ronnie James Dio, I would just play metal. Mm -hmm. I'd be totally cool with that. Yeah. You know, I just don't sing like him. I never mm -hmm. will. I've been in bands that play like that, you know, as a bass player, I, but not as the lead singer. And that's, you know, I still love that stuff. Those bands are just one, they're a lot of work. They're a lot of mm -hmm. like, you know, um, it's a lot of big amplifiers, a lot of big sound. It's a lot of, you know, um, yeah, they're just a lot of work, you know, and you got to pay a lot of people. And mm. as a professional trying to make a living, I'm also thinking about that where for me, those records you heard were me saying, OK, here's the voice you have as a vocalist. Let's write towards that rather than writing you know, right. rock songs or more rock based. Um, and what would you say are 
the influence you draw influences you draw from for those records. Yeah, see, that's what's weird for me. Like, um, what they sound like and the influences are probably a lot different. You know, like mm-hmm. I feel like, and and maybe not. I mean, some a lot of the stuff is like Tom Waits. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Dylan, early, early Tom Waits or early Tom Waits. Okay. I, I'm yeah. For me, it's like closing time. Um, Heart of Saturday Night. Yeah, Heart of Saturday Night. Those are his best records. I, and 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 those are my favorite records. I shouldn't say best. Those are the ones I like when he's he gets into the whole you know, voice yeah. from hell. What's thing. he building in there? Yeah, it just gets kind of nuts for me. And I, <laughs> and I dig it, but I but I definitely he's just such a great songwriter. He's such a great singer. Hmm. Those records are yeah, they're amazing. So yeah, him. Um, you know, certainly Dylan lyrically, hmm. the Beatles production wise, right. David Bowie like for. Hmm for uh just freeing it up to do whatever you want i always tell people like he's you know um everyone says you know speak your truth and this thing and i'm like how would it but like bowie wasn't a you know an alien from mars and you know, that wasn't his <laughs> truth and he wrote amazing right. songs about it you know yeah it's okay too to like just completely free it up and it doesn't have to be this you know um Self exploration, you know, you yeah. can create and stuff. So, um, or you can just write lyrics that are like nonsense. Like, a, I really like Beck, sure, and the way he, he wrote stuff, like a loser or where it's at. It's sure. just they don't they don't really mean anything, but like it's that per, the particular sequence of mouth noises, it sure. just those yeah. they, they, it sounds great. And some of the stuff just in the, you know, in the time of chimpanzees, I was a monkey. Yeah. It's like <laughs> freaking brilliant. Yeah. It's one of my favorite lines ever in a song. <laughs> but it's amazing. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's a really great like line. It says so much, and you're like, um But it says nothing at all at the same time, really. Sure. I mean, or I guess, you could or yeah. it leaves it open to interpretation. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like it's saying, like, yeah, man, I'm surrounded by chimpanzees and i'm a monkey you know what i mean that's that's tough <laughs> yeah it's a tough road to take you know yeah. people feel like that i think people identify with that yeah in a time of this insanity i'm sane you know <laughs> and like i'm here like or i'm di- or in a time of san- it's saneness i'm i'm like out here just losing my mind like so there's right this cool thing. And he's, you know, like Sea Change is one of my favorite records. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I think that might be, that's one of the key records that made me want to become a musician. Yeah. Sea no, Change. He's, he's amazing, you know? So he's a guy that can like write a, a funk record and and, a, yeah. and, a, and, a, and, a, and this record and that record and all of a sudden sit down with an acoustic guitar and just yeah. blow your mind. Yeah, no, it's an amazing record. And um, the follow-up's really good as well. Um, what was it called? Guero, right? Um, or do you mean the other acoustic Yeah, singing? the other, like the follow-up to Sea Change. Morning Phase. Yeah, Morning yeah. Phase, great record. Yeah. You know, I like Sea Change better, but it's yeah. still Morning About, Phase is, is a great record. It has its well. moments, like um on that track, Wave, yeah. where it's just a symphonic kind of orchestral piece. Sure. Based around his voice. Yeah. Or like all the, I think of Sea Change as a, great record especially because of all like the string arrangements his father did david campbell but then on morning phase he like doubled down on that just so like so many more strings sure and stuff sure. especially yeah. on tracks like wave yeah yeah no it's good stuff yeah so that's it i mean i feel like you know and and um yeah i, th- I think you know for me those are kind of it's it's that older stuff like i i, I feel i'm more of a I, I love Beck and all, but I feel like was, I'm more of a contemporary of Beck, you know, just mm-hmm. where for me the influences come from, you know, the, the older stuff. Um, but I'm still taking, yeah, I'm still aware of what he's doing and Wilco and bands like that. Yeah. And, and, and um, but I'm trying to put my voice in, in that rather, you know, you know, in, in with them rather than taking the influence from, you know, Dylan and McCartney and, and right, that okay. stuff, you know, so. All right. Um, I, I suppose that's it. Sounds good. <laughs> do, you have, do, you have big, do you have a big close for, well, your, no. for your podcast? That's no. it? No. You just say, I suppose that's it? And that's <laughs> yeah. It. Beautiful. All right, man. Well, thanks for having me. And thanks for coming on. Yeah. Good luck. Mm-hmm.